All right, Hebrews chapter 11, yes, come on, then Acts here. chapter number 7. If you read in Hebrews chapter 11, we'll come down to verse 23. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 23. Mm. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 23. Notice the Bible says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. Keep your hand there because we'll be preaching out of both of these passages and come over to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And let's look down, if you will, in verse number 18. We'll back up to 17. Acts chapter 7, verse 17. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end that they might not live. In which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him, and avenged him that was oppressed, and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then Mo fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begot two sons. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Jay if he would pray and ask the Lord to bless the message for us, please. So by way of review, 1 Corinthians 10 tells us as we studied, basically that we are going to be tempted. And he says in the passage that there is no temptation taken you. That is a real thing. We are going to be tempted. It is all inclusive, but it's also individual. But the danger in being tempted is not just knowing about it. The danger is being like the preacher preached this morning. You just get comfortable. You just get to thinking that you're okay. You get to thinking that things are all right, and you're going to church, and you're reading your Bible, and you're kind of going through the motions, so you're good, but you're not good. And the problem is you get into a place where you get comfortable as He preached, and you don't take heed. And when you don't take heed, that's when the devil slips up on you. Now the Bible also says in the passage that God is faithful. Now, God is faithful because He helps us plan and prepare. When you think about Daniel, we saw a great example of this as a young man. Daniel said no to the world and yes to God. I believe we saw the same stream of conviction in Joseph as a young person because when he got to the place where he was tempted, he had already made up his mind. And he wasn't going to try to resist sin. He was going to run from it. And he had the courage to run. 
And you've got to know yourself and you've got to know that you can't fight sin on your own. You're no match for it. Here's the crazy thing. If you couldn't fight sin and save yourself before salvation, what makes you think you can fight it and help yourself after salvation? We should be depending on Jesus Christ by faith just like we did when we got saved. No works, faith. Now, when we study the temptations, obviously Luke chapter number 4, the devil comes to Christ and he gives him these two temptations. And the first one he says is, look, you take the stones and you can turn them to, to bread and you can have you something to eat. And when we go back to Genesis chapter 3, we know that that matches exactly what the devil did to Eve, showing us that we have the three main temptations that were presented in the very beginning of the Bible presented to Jesus. Because the Bible says He went through all things, was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So He said, hey, why don't you turn this bread into stones? And why don't you do this? And just like when she saw the tree was good for food. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, all that is in the world first, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. So we see this order in the temptation. The devil comes and basically says, just do it yourself, Jesus. You're the Son of Man, but if you're really the Son of God, you can act independently of God. You don't need God to do this for you. You can turn the stones into bread. You can just please your appetite. You want another piece of apple cake? You want, what do we have, apple turnover? Just go get another piece. Nobody's going to stop you. The devil comes in and what he does is he tries to use our appetites that are in us against us. And that's why we studied some things about legitimate appetites and illegitimate appetites. Some hungers and desires God has put in you and that's good, but some hungers and desires the devil will twist. Just like music. Bob Jones Sr. said every bad thing is a good thing twisted. And you take this music and you take it and you twist it just a little bit and you get the little beat going. And then it's not, it's not the same as running around throwing your hand up. Now you're doing the jig. Don't do the jig for Jesus. Don't do the jig for Jesus. David danced before the Lord. It's different. A good things, a good thing, a bad thing's a good thing twisted. So Satan comes up and basically says, "You know, it's not wrong to eat. Nothing wrong with eating, Jesus. But it's wrong to eat when God said you need to live by His word." And that what He said: "Man shall not live by bread alone." I'm out here trying to live by by the word of God. You're trying to tell me to live by bread. The devil says, "Live by your appetites, not by the spirit. Live by the flesh, not by the spirit." And so it's, he says, you know, it's not wrong to marry Joseph. Nothing wrong with having a female companion, Joseph. And Potiphar's wife, she really likes you. And she's been kind of looking at you for a long time. And surely, you know, you and her would be a better fit than her and Potiphar. It's not wrong to get married, but it's wrong to marry the wrong person. Amen. It's wrong to commit adultery. It's wrong to marry another man's wife. So, as we begin to think about this, we can apply this all across the board. There's nothing wrong with talking. But you don't need to be gossiping about people. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Nothing, wrong with, nothing wrong with reading, but you need to read the right thing. So you take that, and the devil will take our appetites and twist them. And so now we move to the next one. He shows them all the kingdoms of the world in the moment of time and says, all, this, all these kingdoms will I give thee. If thou wilt therefore bow down and worship me, all will be thine. And so that's the second temptation here. And so we have not the lust of the flesh, but we have the lust of the eyes. And that matches when Eve saw the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes. And it matches this right here, the lust of the eyes. And I want to preach a little bit about ambition. A little bit about ambition, not appetite here. And when you think about Genesis chapter number 3, you see this lust of the eyes thing. And it actually has something to do with this first one because the Bible said that Eve, when she saw the tree was good for food. So what the devil will do is he will use the lust of the eyes to activate the lust of the flesh. Young men in here, you need to be real careful what you look at, especially when you deal with girls and things like that because the devil will take the lust of the eyes to activate the lust of the flesh. And so you have to be real careful along these lines. So the Bible says it was pleasant to the eyes. It was a tree desired to make one wise. So as we think about these temptations, what the devil is doing here, he's trying to get Eve to elevate herself. 
He's trying to say, look, this looks good, doesn't it? It looks like if you eat this, you're going to be a whole lot better off. It looks like if you eat this, you can move from just being a woman to a God. You can move from being underneath Adam to being your own God. You can run your own life. You can have the ambition to be somebody, be all you can be, right? And so we have this idea of Satan, Satan turning a look into lust, a desire into a decision, then he turns a choice into a chain, and then he takes Eve, who is a sinner now, and she becomes a seducer. She gets Eve to sin. You see, the devil knew how to get Adam. He got Adam by getting Eve. He goes after Eve and he knows that Adam loves her enough to where he'll make the choice and he'll fall. She becomes a seducer and she gets him. And it all starts with this lust of the eyes right here. Now you know Satan will try to get you ahead of God. Satan will try to get you to be ambitious. What does it say? It says he took Christ and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a what? Moment of time. Boom. All the kingdoms. Think about that thing, a moment of time? It shows him all the kingdoms. I thought the Bible says when he was born that he was the king of the Jews. I thought Gabriel said he's going to sit on the throne of his father. I thought the Bible taught that he is going to be king of kings and lord of lords. The Bible says in Revelation 11, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. What's the devil doing here? The devil's saying, let me show you something real quick. Let me show you a quick way to get what you really want, Jesus. You're born to be a king. You're not born to go through this three and a half years of, of misery and have all these people get mad at you. Just go ahead and take over. You're the king. Be a little ambitious. What about David and Saul? It's real similar. God had anointed David, but Saul was still, still the king. And you know what David did? David always respected that. And David realized, I can't get ahead of God's timing. I can't be so ambitious that I wind up committing murder and killing this guy. David many times could have killed Saul and right. taken over the throne. People would have supported him. Yeah. The devil would have been right beside him saying, good job. We have to be real careful. Instant success is a dangerous thing because it will rob you of the journey. Instant success will rob you of the journey. You know, there's only one endeavor where you can start out on top immediately. That I can think of. Maybe there's a few more. Only one you can really start on the top, and that's when you dig a hole. Amen? And then you go down. Yeah. Now God's pattern is there's suffering first, then there's glory to follow. Yeah. Satan's pattern is, I'll give you the glory. Just look at this right here. Quick, you can have it right now. Let's go. I'll give it to you. Be ambitious. Let's take it. And then later on, you're going to pay the price Amen. because you will have to suffer for that. Now I want us to look at Moses' life here and hopefully we can get the idea. We had the first sermon was obviously uh, saying no to the world, yes to God. And then we dealt with Joseph and Joseph comes in and Joseph says, I have the courage to run. Now when we deal with the lust of the eyes, I want to deal with Moses. The Bible says he could see the invisible. I want us to look at this a different way. And like I said, there's a paradox in the Christian life. I think oftentimes we just hammer things and hammer things and hammer things and we don't see the flip side of it. If we just dump everything out and we don't fill it up, then it's going to be empty. And when it's empty, the other, the Bible says the unclean spirit come in and they fill up that void. So you have to be real careful. Say, okay, I'm not going to look at this, not going to look at this, not going to look at this, not going to look at this. What are you going to look at? Because you're going to look at something. Well, I'm not going to listen to this anymore. I'm not going to listen to this. I'm not going to watch that anymore. I'm not going to read that anymore. I'm not going to go there anymore. I'm not going to do... What are you going to do? Be a hermit? No, you're going to have to go somewhere. You're going to have to listen to something. You're going to have to read something. You're going to have to talk to somebody. You've got to replace the bad with the good. There's got to be repentance from dead works, but repentance to God. I'm all for preaching against bad things. We ought to be against something. Right? That's what they say in the South. Again. You're getting something, you're getting something. You don't know what a preacher's for until you know what he's against. Amen. But I think by now you pretty much know what we're against. I ain't going to waste your time telling you what all we're against. Amen. We need help moving from being against something and being for something Amen. to get some help in this. So what did Moses do? He could see the invisible. Now let's go through this. I want you to come back to Acts. We'll look at Acts first. 
If you're going to be able to deal with the lust of the eyes, you're going to have to have heavenly sight. If, 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 if you're going to deal with the fact of what the devil tries to show you on this earth, which leads to covetousness, which leads to idolatry, if you're going to deal with what you see, and we are inundated, especially in this generation now. Now everything is visual. Now people want to see it. They got it up there. The commercials are just boom, boom, boom. They flip it every so many seconds. You got to see it. It's grabs your eye. Your sensory nerves in your eye are made to catch movement. And something moves, you just naturally look at it. And so constantly the devil's saying, look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. Don't you want this? Don't you want this? This is where you could be. You could be like this person. You could be on American Idol. You could get up there and sing. And Brother Gene could do a flip on American Idol. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. This could be you. This could be you. You know, everything's about you. And you have to be real careful with that because if you keep looking at that long enough, you'll start believing it. You've got to, the Bible says, we look not at things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporal. The things which are not seen are eternal. You have got to have heavenly sight. You've got to have, see the invisible. So let's look at Moses' life. And the first thing I want to see, look in Acts chapter 7. Let's come down to verse number uh, uh, 22. Acts chapter 7, verse number 22. The Bible says, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. So we see that from Acts chapter 7, how that he was learned in all of these things and he had been raised in the house of Pharaoh and I believe he was probably groomed to be the next Pharaoh. But in Hebrews chapter 11 we read the text where the Bible says that he was come to years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That's in 11.24. Uh, and so pleasing God is more important popularity. Pleasing God is more important than popularity. We can add prestige to that. But think about this. Think about what the devil was doing with the kingdoms of the world in Christ and then compare that with Moses and how that here is Pharaoh's daughter raising up Moses and he's being taught in all the best schools. He's being trained all the best ways. You talk about someone with worldly wisdom. What if we were to have a social IQ test? And I was to ask you certain things. And if I was to give names of video games and names of chat rooms and names of the... How well would you do? I think Moses probably would have done very well. He was raised up in that worldly environment. He was raised up in all the aspects of Egypt and they were grooming him to be the next Pharaoh. He had to make a choice to see something beyond what was in front of him. You've got to see what's in front of you. The devil wants you just to see this, lust of the eyes, and see this, and then he wants to drive you with this. You know what, like I said last time, got to define everything backwards. We've got to see the judgment seat of Christ. We've got to see eternity. That's what matters. All the other variables, things can change. Well, I'm going to live in this kind of house and I'm going to have this kind of family. I'm going to get a dog and I'm going to do this and I'm going to be successful. I'm going to have this and have that. Judgment seat of Christ? I'm not saying you don't have to work. I'm not saying you don't have to get married. I'm not saying you can't have joyful life here with Christ, and we can, but you don't need to have a joyful life with the sacrificing of the everlasting life you're going to have. That's what a lot of Christians do. They sacrifice what they could get at the judgment seat of Christ by pleasing themselves here and now. You know, it's going to cost you to see invisible. It's going to cost you to see the invisible. What in the world went through Moses? I mean, here's Moses. I mean, it's easy to, to say what you would do, but what if you were in that situation? To be in line to be the next Pharaoh. And you had everything at your disposal. Forty years, Moses' life's divided up into three forties. That first forty years, he's got plenty of time to be thinking about this. Don't you know the devil's walking up beside him saying, hey, let me, uh, let me tell you something. There's some people out here you can control one day. Not only can you have all the money and all the women and all the wealth, but you can have power. You can have people coming to you and serving you and doing everything you say. He's trying to drive him with this thing. The lust of the eyes. Look over in Hebrews chapter number 11. 
Hebrews chapter number 11. Seeing the invisible. You say, preacher, how in the world can I deal with all the junk that's out there, all the stuff they're showing me? Don't look at it. I know you've got to look at stuff because you've got to walk down the road, but you've got to see that which is invisible. You've got to have your eyes focus on eternity. You've got to see that what the consequences are going to be. Like I told you last night, the other side of the billboard. You've got to see what other people aren't seeing. Moses had something in him that he could see who is invisible. And he had another sight. You have the Holy Spirit of God inside of you. It's like a homing pigeon. My dad, when he was small, he raised pigeons. And he could go off like miles and miles and let those jokers go. They'd beat him home. They had something inside of them, how they were trained, where they knew where home was. If you're saved, you've got a homing pigeon on the inside. You've got the Holy Ghost of God. And one day the Holy Spirit of God is going to break out inside of you and this old corruptible body is going to be fashioned like into His glorious body and it's, you, it's going to go home. So there's something on the inside of you that knows there's a home beyond the river. There's something on the inside of you that knows you're going to see Him face to face. You've got to see that. You've got to listen to His voice and look through His eyes. All right, Hebrews chapter 11. The second thing I want you to see here, come down to verse number 25. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Notice he chose purity over pleasure. Purity over pleasure. The Bible says that we're likened unto vessels in 2 Timothy 2. We're supposed to be a vessel that's meat for the Master's use. God wants you to be pure for Him. He doesn't want you to be pure so you can walk around and say, look at me, you know, I haven't ever drank anything stronger than buttermilk. You know, look at me, I've never seen an R-rated movie. Look at me, I've read my Bible. No, the Lord wants you to be pure so He can shine through you. He wants you to be pure so you'll be sensitive to His leading and you will let Him use you in your life. So if He says, hey, I need your hand for a minute, you say, okay, here, Lord. Here, grab a track with that hand and give it to somebody. Hey, I need your tongue for a minute. You say, here, Lord. I need you to tell people about me for a minute. I need your ear for a minute. You say, okay, here, Lord. I need you to listen to my words. I need your eyes for a minute. You say, here, Lord. I need you to read my word. Purity. Purity over pleasure. The devil, what he does is, he takes Jesus and shows everything in a moment of time. And what the devil will do is he'll give you just a little flash of sin, just a little taste of it, just a little picture of it, just to kind of whet your appetite, right? And he wants to drive you in a certain position here to where you, that thing that goes in your eye, lodges in your head. And when it lodges in your head, it becomes a thought. And that thing, as we said the other night, it turns into imaginations. And then you begin to think about it more and more and more. You know, I wonder what it would be like if I did eat of that fruit. I bet, I guarantee you, before Eve ever went over there and really got serious about pulling that fruit off the tree, she was looking at it for a long time. Maybe Adam would catch her as they were walking in the, the garden there. He'd catch her and say, Honey, where you, why, why are you lagging behind? There she is just looking at that tree over there. Honey, you, you don't need to be looking over in that direction. Come over here. We're going we're gonna to go over here and pick some pears and stuff. You know, what, Just always looking at it. Like the prodigal son, he was always looking way far off. He could see the lights of the city. He had a far away look in his eye. He's out there doing his chores, but he was half-heartedly. He didn't really want to do his chores. He's thinking, man, I want to get out of the country, man. I want to get to the big city. Man, I heard tell somebody show, showed me a picture one time of what it looks like downtown city there. I'd, li I'd like to check that out. And year after year, he thought about that thing. And then when his father would get on to him and have to chase him and do stuff, he would get mad about that, and he would gravitate toward that wickedness. Let me say this, and I said it the other night. Just because you're in a Bible-believing church, just because you're in a good family is no guarantee you're going to turn out right. That's right. That's right. You've got to make up your mind. Amen. You don't want the world. That's right. yeah. Yeah. And let me say this. Oh, you do church. not have to taste it to spit it out. Right. You can spit it out right now. Yeah. You can spit it out. You can avoid a whole lot of trouble. Amen. You don't have to taste it. 
So the devil says, hey, just look at it. Just look at it. It's appetizing. It looks real good. Have you ever been to places like bakeries and they make cakes and all this kind of stuff? And they'll have this stuff, and I forget what they, what they call it, but they use it for these wedding cakes and stuff. And they'll have a thing all set up there, and it stays there. I mean, for months. And if you looked at it, you thought, man, that's good. I could just dig in. You wouldn't want to eat that stuff. It looks good, but looks can be deceiving. And so we see here, purity is more important than pleasure. He takes Jesus and shows him everything in a moment of time. And that gives a hint to what Moses will see. And Moses will see, and yeah, I see these other guys that are in uh, states of uh, maybe politics, maybe guys that were the senators, maybe guys that were underneath Pharaoh and how they had, maybe his peers, the princes and things that were being raised up. And he saw how they were gravitating toward that evil kingdom and how they wanted all the worldliness of Egypt. But he saw that what they were going to get was only going to last for a little while. He saw that it was like a candle that was going to burn out. There's only pleasure in sin for a season. It may look good, but you know what? If you were to go downtown and you were to go out and try to see all these people that are partying downtown, you would see a different group than you'd see 20 years ago. The group down there 20 years ago, they're either in jail or they're dead or they're hung up on drugs somewhere. They're gone. It's just a new group comes in. The devil says, okay, we'll take this group. After he uses you and abuses you, he will kick you to the curb. The world has no use for you. The devil has no use for you. He will use your eyes to deceive you, to lie to you, to get you to think that you want it, and then he will tear you to pieces. He will rip you to shreds because he's a roaring lion. Don't follow the lust of the eyes. The sins that you hold on to today in this camp, some of you may be holding to some stuff today and you're going to take it down from the mountain. Those are going to be the sins that are going to hold on to you tomorrow. If you hold on to them today, they're going to hold on to you tomorrow. I can do all things through Christ. You know, the Bible says, lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Do you know that you really can't see right and you can't walk right You're in your race unless you lay down those weights? I'm firmly convinced of that in my own life. And you say, I want to get closer, I want to get closer, like Moses, you know, he's heard God's voice. Remember when he heard him in the bush, and he heard God's voice, and he saw this burning bush, so he started getting closer, and as he got closer, God said, take your shoes off. Well, Lord, Lord, I want to get closer, not until you take your shoes off. You've got to make, you've got to see purity is way better than pleasure. You've got to see that your priority of doing right and serving Jesus Christ is way better than just having some pleasure that's only going to last for a little while. I know they look like they're having a good time. There are always smiles on the outside, but you don't see them when they're writing the suicide notes. You don't see them when they're crying out and they're begging for some kind of help, and they're sitting in some counselor's office that don't even have a Bible, and they're trying to find the meaning of their existence. You don't see these people when they have all the success, all the fame, and then their families are destroyed. And they lose everything. The Hollywood and the society, they don't paint that picture. You need to understand that purity is what you have, what we had tonight, I wouldn't trade it for nothing. I wouldn't trade it for nothing. So, well, we have this auditorium. You could preach to 10,000 people. No, I'd, be, I'd rather be right here. Right here. Say why? This is where God is. God's on the mountain tonight. Purity is more important than pleasure. Satan will try to get you to see what you want to please yourself. Then notice here, you're still in Hebrews. Let's move down here to chapter 11 here. Look in verse number 26. We're going to take this thing just a step further. Look down in verse number 26. It says, He esteemed the reproach of Christ, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. We have respect to the recompense of the reward. Persecution over possessions. The steaming reproach. He saw reproach. Almost like when it says Jesus 
He had joy when He went to the cross? Who for the joy that was set before Him? See, so you get on high ground when you move into this area because you're beginning to see with eyes of faith instead of eyes of flesh. You're beginning to see the invisible instead of just what the devil puts in front of you. And you realize it's more important to take a reproach, to be laughed at, to be made fun of, to have somebody talk about you, to have somebody not be your friend, than it is to gain possessions, to gain popularity. A lot of Christians, they check out right here because they've become so Americanized. American Christianity is a hard Christianity. The biggest problem we have, I believe, as Christians is not pain. The biggest problem I believe we have is with pleasure. Pleasure will spoil you rotten. And so when you think about this, we have to realize to see spiritually, we lose things for Christ's sake. So you lose something down here. You don't get the promotion because they discriminated against you because you were a Christian. And believe me, it happens. You don't get the promotion or you choose not to take the job that's going to keep you out of church when church doors are open. So therefore, you can't work the overtime to put the money in your pocket to buy the things that you want. You esteem reproach of Christ more important. Giving sacrificially. That's where everybody checks out as well. To say, you know what? It's not about what else can I buy for me. It's about what I can give for Him. And if it's going to cost me something, it's okay. Worship always costs something. Well, I, I just couldn't bring myself to say amen. The Bible calls that a sacrifice of praise. You look so stupid. You look so stupid running down there and screaming your head off. You look like an idiot. Yeah, I do. I can be a fool for Jesus. Be a fool for Christ. Sometimes it's easier to do it around our brothers. But when you're out there, you know, around people that aren't saved, I'm not telling you to go up and be so weird they think you got the cooties. But no, you can, you can talk about Jesus bring up the Lord and mention God and, and give Him some praise, some sacrifice of praise. Amen. And you might get some persecution and as the, we go further and further down the, the Laodicean trail in this age that we live in, it may get worse and worse. It very well may be. And if we can't stand now, we're never going to be able to stand then. Amen. He had sight to see that persecution was actually something to be valued. Look, I'm not advocating people to go out and they do stupid stuff just so they get locked up in jail and say, I got locked up for Jesus. No, you got locked up because you were stupid. You were an idiot. Can y'all say that? Idiot. But if you're serving God and you're doing right and you get it in the neck, that's for Him. That's for Him. It's a sacrifice of praise. That alabaster box has to be broken. That means... It's, it's, it's not yours anymore, it's His, and it fills the womb. I want you to look, if you will, over in Acts chapter number 7, and we'll kind of bring it to a close, and then we'll get into the maps. We'll preach from Dan to Beersheba. We'll cross the Jordan River seven times. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, come down if you will. Acts chapter 7, look down if you will to, you know the story of what happens. He stands up when he's 40 years of age, verse number 23. Came into his heart to visit his brethren. Verse 24, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. The next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do you wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses fled at that saying. 
You know, Moses tried to do the right thing. It's 40 years of age. He stood up. And even though he's doing the right thing, the devil's right beside him. I mean, if, the, if, if Jesus Christ is going to have the devil pull up beside him, don't you know he's going to pull up beside us? And he pulls up beside him at 40 years of age, and he says, you know what? I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to stand up for my people. I'm going to say no to the world, yes to God. And he stands up, but the devil has him with this whole thing of rights in front of him, of the things that's right in front of him, and he can't see the long view, and he begins to go ahead and take the law into his own hands, and he kills this guy. Buries him in the sand. Don't you know when all this happened, he had had the long view, and I believe it was kind of like Joseph. He knew he was meant for something. And I believe maybe his mother, because she was his nurse and he was, you know, up to four or maybe years old and she had probably been teaching him some Hebrew songs and letting him know that he's Moses and, and all these kind of things. And he, had, he, he knew who he was and he made these decisions and he had this sight. He could see far off. He could see he who was invisible. He could see those things. But in the moment, quickly, it got away from him and he got off base. And the Bible says he fled. He took off and ran. I believe he pulled up under that juniper tree and Elijah maybe hadn't been there yet so he put his name in there first. You know, everybody's got their name under the juniper tree. If you go, if you go under the juniper tree, you'll see my name. Because we've I've been under the juniper tree. You get to Juniper Junction and you pull in there and you're like, I'm done. I'm wiped out. I'm no good. I have messed up. I had a good vision for a while, but then I started looking at this world. I got my eyes off Jesus like the Apostle Peter, and I started sinking down in the water. I am rotten. I am no good. I'm not worthy to be saved, number one. And now, I'm not even worthy to serve Him. All those other people are, are doing good, and they're serving Jesus, and look what a mess I made. Even the contemporary Christians wouldn't have nothing to do with me. Surely the Bible believers, they just talk about me. Use me for an illustration in a sermon. Right? He had to get back to this site where he had faith again and he could see the invisible. Forty years goes by. Forty years. So I want to say this last thing that prospect, which is the future, and I'm just making everything easy to remember, the prospect's got to be greater than your past. Wherever you are tonight, it really doesn't matter. We're not here to beat you up because you messed up last year, you messed up last week, you messed up yesterday. We sang about the love of Christ. We sang about the blood of Christ. We sang about a forgiving God. And guess what? He does understand because He's been tempted just like you've been tempted. With those lusts of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. And, and maybe things got away with you and you got ambitious about a certain area and you got off track and you kind of began to do things on your own and, and something slipped. And you weren't seeing He who is invisible anymore. And you weren't looking at things that are unseen. You didn't have your mind on heaven. You weren't seeing the judgment seat of Christ. You weren't seeing the fact that being pure is more important. You just saw the flesh that was in front of you. Please don't let guilt overtake you. God, the Holy Ghost, will use guilt. But He'll always have the other, you know, you have the sheepdog mercy and grace, you know. He'll always have the brother of guilt, which is grace. Where there's guilt, there's always grace. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So I've got off track. I've been looking at the wrong things. I've been looking at the world. I've been thinking about what I want to do. The devil's kind of shown me. And I've seen somebody I emulate, and I kind of want to be like them. And Come back to Luke chapter 4, and we'll close it out. This stuff is serious. You say, well, I don't matter to God. You, you know how much you matter to Him? He shed the most precious thing in the universe. He gave it for you. So I am nobody. 
Well, yeah, in, your, in and of yourself you are nobody. But in Christ, His blood was shed for you. You matter to God. The fact that you failed and the fact that you messed up, it bothers Him. He said, how do you know? The great, one of the greatest stories that Jesus tells to show us about God is the story of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son is not a, a, a salvation story. In that parable in Luke 15, it's divided up into three things. You have the lost silver, the lost son, and the lost... Uh, uh, what's the other one? Sheep. Lost sheep is Jew. Lost silver is ten. Ten pieces, Gentile. Lost son is church. That's the story of the church. And you've got somebody that's already a son of God, which you're, you're saved, you're a son of God, you go astray. And the Lord says, I want to show you what God's like. God meets you halfway when you come running. He wants to forgive you. He wants to cover up the filth that you got involved in when you became ambitious, filled with appetite. He says, let's cover this up. Let's put some shoes on his feet. Let's kill the fatted calf. My son has come home. That's the love of the Father. Now look over here in Luke chapter number 4 and you'll see how this thing's so serious. Come down, if you will, Luke chapter number 4. This is when the devil's tempting Jesus. Verse 5, he takes him to a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and whomsoever I will, I give it. We know that because 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that the devil is the god of this world. Okay? Verse 7, here's what I want you to see. He's using the lust of the eyes to get him to follow his own ambition, which unbeknownst to the person who follows the lust of the eyes and follows their own ambition, unbeknownst to them, this is what they're doing. Verse 7. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. When you follow the lust of the eyes, you're following your own ambition. That's exactly what the devil wants you to do. But in order to get what he promises, you've got to bow down to it. The devil will always imitate and mimic and copy God. Those who do not choose to worship Jesus Christ to be saved, they will suffer for all eternity. So what the devil will do is to get you to pay a price in suffering to follow him. And he says, bow the knee. So well, I'm not a Satan worshiper. I don't believe in all that. Okay, well, the Bible says about the lust of the eyes. In Colossians, it says covetousness is idolatry. So here's Jesus on the throne because you can see the invisible. You can see heaven. You can see spiritual things. You're living by faith. But then as you begin to look at the things of the world and the lights of the world allure your eyes and draw you away, they begin to get bigger and bigger than Jesus. And the next thing you know, they're up high and Jesus is down low and you're bowing down to the things of this world. And who is in control of this world? The devil. Is it possible for a Christian to worship the devil? I'll leave that up to you. This is serious. You say, well, it's no big deal. I don't look at this stuff. No big deal. I, I don't. No, you better watch out. Because the devil will take those eyes and he'll bring it to exactly what he wants for appetite and for ambition. That's why Jesus said the light of the body is the eye. You've got to, have your, you've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Looking unto Jesus, the Amen. author and finisher of our faith. Because if you look at it, if you get sidetracked, that's the world and your ambitions, and you try to be like that, the next thing you know, you're underneath the feet of the devil. Do you see the invisible? Let's have an altar call.